so where were we last time? Um, so we started talking about, you know, we covered the definition of the class uh, QMA. Um, and we talked about how the local Hamiltonian's problem uh, is a problem in, in QMA. Logan, I'm going to mute you if that's okay. Oh, sorry, I thought I did. No worries. Um, and we started talking about uh, the, the quantum analog of the Cook Levin theorem. Right, which is supposed to show um, that the local Hamiltonian's problem is actually QMA complete. It's, uh, in some sense, like the hardest problem uh, for QMA. So LH, I'm going to use as my abbreviation for a local Hamiltonian's problem. Uh, this is QMA complete. Um, and we started talking about that uh, <clears throat> last week, and uh, we'll, we'll finish that um, today. Uh, and then um, after that, then we're going to jump into uh, something called the PCP theorem uh, and the quantum PCP conjecture. Okay, so there's lots to get through today and we'll see how much uh, we get through. Um, before we finish the, the proof of the quantum Cook-Levin theorem, uh, I'm going to have to explain some properties of, of QMA. Um, so let's remind ourselves what, what, <clears throat> what QMA is. So <clears throat> QMA is a class of decision problems. Uh, where, you know, there's a family of verifier circuits All right, one for each input length that you might consider where um, for all instances x, if x is a yes instance for your decision problem and uh, your, your instance x is n bits long, then there exists a quantum proof psi where if you took the nth circuit of your family and plugged in your instance and this proof and maybe some in syllabits, this would accept, meaning that it outputs one as its answer with probability at least two thirds. And on, on the other hand, if uh, you have a no instance, then no matter what quantum proof you come up with, uh, the verifier is going to accept with probability that's at most one thirds. Okay. Um, so these two numbers, this two thirds and one thirds, uh, we give it a name. So this uh, one, two thirds is called the completeness. And this one third is called the soundness. Um, and these numbers are kind of arbitrary. I mean, they're, they're these probability browns that are used to distinguish between the, the yes and no instances. Um, but it, they're not so crucial uh, for the definition of QMA. So it, in fact, you can change these, these two thirds and one thirds to uh, any other separated constants uh, that you would like. And it's, it would be exactly the same class. Um, in fact, Here's a more general statement. So if you let QMA, and then we're gonna give uh, two subscripts, A comma B, um, and actually let's change it to C comma S just to make it uh, more clear, uh, to be uh, QMA with uh, completeness C and soundness S.
right? So you just replace the two thirds and one thirds with CNS. Um, then actually what is true is that this is the same class as the one that I described above where you have two thirds, one thirds, so long as the difference between C minus S is not too small. And by this, I mean that they're separated by some inverse polynomial amount. So this is a, a theorem. And this, I mean, this kind of formalizes the notion that two thirds and one thirds don't really matter. Um, any C and S would do as long as they're not too close together. Like an example of a C and S that, that um, wouldn't be the same would be if we let them be exponentially close to each other. Okay, um, that would be asking for too much. Quick question, if I may. Of course. Um, when we say like poly n, so like n here is the length of the input, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And we're just saying, you know, kind of c minus c and s can vary, uh, you know, for different inputs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it was uh, just unclear to me. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, typically C and S are constants, but we even allow them to uh, get closer and closer as the input length grows. Uh, they just can't get uh, close too fast as the input length grows. Um, and let's just see a quick proof of this. Like the reason that you know, it doesn't matter what CNS we choose as long as they're inverse polynomial separated from each other uh, is because we can amplify this completeness soundness gap um, to basically any constant we like by repeating the verification procedure. Um, so, you know, let's say you started with a verifier, um, a QMA verifier for some QMA problem uh, that, have, that has some completeness soundness gap C and S. Right, so I'm going to create a new verifier for the exact same language um, that has a much better gap. So, so here's a new verifier. And it's going to expect uh, a quantum proof on, um, you know, more qubits. So it's going to expect uh, a quantum proof. of the form psi one, tensor psi two, tensor dot, 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 tensor psi t, okay, where t is some number that we'll choose later. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if the original verifier, it took in proofs of size m, then this would take in uh, proofs of size m t. Okay, so uh, first we should say this is what the verifier V prime expects, but of course Merlin, you know, we don't necessarily trust Merlin. It could provide any arbitrary quantum state on MT qubits. Okay, we just hope that it's of this tensor product form. Okay, we're just gonna set some counter X to zero, and then we're gonna repeat something uh, T times we're going to uh, execute Vn on our instance x. The, the tth block of m qubits. And then we're just going to measure the output qubit of this uh, circuit. If outcome is one, then we just increment uh, x. Otherwise, we don't do anything. So we just keep a counter of how many times um, you know this verifier circuit accepts. Right? 
And then we just count how many times uh, did this original verification circuit accept. So we just say if it's greater than, um, let's say, C minus uh, some parameter epsilon, then accept. Otherwise, reject. So I've described uh, a new verifier for some QMA uh, language uh, or decision problem L. Uh, and you know, we're hoping that it has a much better um, completeness soundness gap. Right, so does, does, this, does this description of V prime make sense to people? Any, any questions about this? Right, this should look pretty familiar. Like it should look like the way that you know we showed that this local Hamiltonian's problem is in QMA. Uh, are are there two x's? Are there two x's? Oh yes, you're right. Um, I guess one is supposed to be capital X, but I guess uh, when I'm writing it, it it shouldn't be obvious. So let me just call this um, y. So yeah, you're right. X X should be the um, the instance that, that's in question. Uh, y is going to be a counter that keeps track of how often um, the verification the original verification circuit accepted. Okay, so um, you know let's analyze this. I mean, this should be pretty intuitive, um, but let's go through it. So let's say we have a yes case, right? So X is uh, in uh, L yes. Uh, you know, what is the maximum acceptance probability of this new verifier V prime? Uh, well, what's a quantum proof? Uh, you know, what's a quantum proof that we should plug into V prime? Any, any thoughts on that? The actual proof for X repeated T times. Uh, and by actual proof, you mean like the proof that v you that v that v would use. Yes. So ma maximize his own pro pro probability of acceptance. Good. So uh, you know that v was this verifier for uh, for L. So there exists some psi such that v on x psi is zero, and psi, this is uh, n qubits, except with so probability greater than c, right? So let's just take that particular psi. So now the proof for v prime will be just capital T copies of psi, right? So this is mt copies. Um, and now it should be pretty straightforward, right? Like you're just verifying the same proof over and over again. And, you know, again, by a lar law of large numbers, uh, the fraction of times that V accepts would be roughly C, right? So more formally, you know, the probability that, um, so, so let's say YI is indicator variable or not y, but say yt, indicator variable that the tth uh, verification accepted. What do we know about um, each of these yt's? Well, they're independent. You're, you know, you're doing this independently. And the expectation of, of yt is going to be greater than, than c by definition, right? So, so this just follows from from um, our assumption, right? So, so what's the probability that, you know, if you, you take a bunch of uh, trials, that this is going to be less than C minus epsilon times T? Well, this follows just from a, a standard, like, you know, turn off or hoofding bound. Um, and this is actually going to be exponentially small in, um, in the number of trials that, that you use. So in not just turning it around, the, the probability that, um, that the verifier V prime accepts uh, 
is going to be exponentially close to one. So you're, you're gonna actually get the extremely good uh, completeness parameter here. All right, so in the yes case, the verifier is almost surely going to accept. And in the no case, I mean, let's just consider the, the setting where the proof that's provided by Merlin really is of this tensor product form. You know, just for simplicity. Right, and again, the same analysis holds. We have this indicator variable for whether the T um, uh, verification accepts or not. Well, it's going to be less than S by assumption, right? Because no state would, would make it accept with probability more than S. So using the same turnoff bound, we get that the probability that your estimate of the number of uh, acceptances is greater than say S plus epsilon times T, this is also going to be exponentially small. Okay, so the probability that V prime accepts is going to be less than this exponentially small amount. Right, so, okay, we have to set epsilon so that you know, the verifier doesn't con con confuse. So let's just set epsilon like, you know, half of the gap between the completeness and soundness. Right, so, you know, we're trying to distinguish, you know, here the, the you know, here's zero to one, here's the soundness, here's the completeness, and we know that with high probability, so here's a, you know, C minus epsilon, which is the same as S plus epsilon. So with high probability in the yes case, our estimate won't go below this point. And also with high probability in the no case, our estimate won't go ab above this midpoint. Right, so we can, you know, so we get, um, you know, a new soundness and completeness that's like exponentially good. Um, but you again have the case that uh, Mer Merlin sends you some crazy entang crazy entangled state, <clears throat> like, like for the no case, right? Like Melling can send you some crazy mo monstrous state and you like, you did not analyze this case, if I'm not. You're absolutely right. So we actually didn't uh, complete the, the no case. Um, there are some monsters that uh, one has to deal with, um, but like, I'm just going to sweep that under the rug right now. Um, sure. So, you know, what about when Merlin sends, you know, a monstrous entangled proof state? So the, the key point is that this still holds. I mean, it requires a, a, a more advanced uh, analysis. I mean, it's not too difficult, it's just a little more uh, involved. Um, and, you know, it might show up on the problem set. Um, but the point is that in this case, sending an entangled proof state does not help Merlin. at least entanglement between the, the different uh, blocks of n qubits. Okay. Um, good, so 
So actually a good way to think of, you know, and what's T, I didn't and say what it was, but you know, let's just let T be say um, N divided by epsilon squared over C, all right? So in that case, the, the completeness, this new completeness C prime will be one minus, um, you know, exponential in N and S prime will be something exponentially small in N, okay? And, you know, this is kind of a small number. You only had to repeat this verification process uh, n times, or n over epsilon times, n over epsilon squared. And with, you know, acceptance and rejection probably is this good. I mean, you'll never, you know, if n is anything like, you know, 80, you'll basically never see a false negative or a false positive. Uh, any questions about this? Like, this should be pretty intuitive, I think. Okay, so so we we have this nice property of uh, QMA, which is you know the soundness and completeness are 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 pretty flexible. You know we can without loss of generality assume that. Um, you know, their ex, you know, completeness is exponentially close to one and soundness is exponentially close to zero. So, so now let's turn back to the uh, quantum cook levin theorem. We'll actually use this amplification property. Okay, so uh, what are we trying to show here? You know, we, we start with some QMA problem uh, L and we want to reduce this problem to an instance of the local Hamiltonians problem. So let's say V is the verifier for, for this problem L. So V is just some circuit, right? Uh, it takes in the instance as part of its input. It takes in a, a proof state in some of its registers and, and then also some in syllabits. And at the end, we, we perform a measurement to see whether we accept or reject. Um, and let's say that the, uh, the gates of this verifier are uh, U1, U2, all the way up to UT. Okay. These are all say two qubit gates. All right. And uh, right, so T is just the, the number of gates. The number of gates is polynomial in N because this is a polynomial sized circuit. Um, and from this circuit, we want to define a local Hamiltonian. Uh, that basically captures the behavior of this circuit. Right, and, and the ground states of this local Hamiltonian uh, will encode whether uh, there is a good quantum proof state for this circuit or not. This Hamiltonian is called the Feynman Kitai of Hamiltonian. Okay, what are its properties? So, one property of it. Uh, the, the one that I'm going to define is that its locality is going to be small. Um, okay, so uh, basically, you know, this local Hamiltonian consists of a bunch of terms. Each term acts non-trivially on log t qubits. Okay, so this is not a constant, but let's just, you know, it's small. Um, it can be brought down to a constant uh, using some further tricks. Uh, but let's, let's just keep it simple for now. Okay, so the ground states, what do the ground states of this local Hamiltonian look like? Well, Henry, like... can, I ask, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, how do you define locality in this case? Do, does it mean that the qubits need to be close, close by in the circuit, or it can act on log t qubits uh, which are pretty far apart in the circuit? Or does it matter in this case? 
Good question. Um, so right now, uh, there's no notion of geometric locality. It's just the number of qubits that each term acts on. So that spatially, these qubits could be like far apart. It's just insisting that each term only acts on um, a small number of them. Uh, but actually, there are uh, constructions of the feynman kataev hamiltonian that are also spatially local, like geometrically local. So you can arrange the um, uh, the qubits like uh, on a grid, and you only have nearest neighbor interactions, for example. Um, but the constructions get more complicated because you have to be more clever about how you in, in, encode your computations and so on. Um, but this, you know, this basic version that I'm going to talk about uh, d doesn't insist on that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. So right, H uh, is going to be a sum of terms. Right, so actually, uh, I'll write that down. That's a good point. So uh, not necessarily geometrically local. Great. So, so ground states, um, they're these history states that uh, I briefly mentioned last time. So they have this form they're going to look like a superposition over these snapshots of the verification circuit. So the snapshots are going to range from uh, time zero up to time t. There's going to be a, a log t qubit register that stores which time, uh, which snapshot are we recording. So, so this is going to be a, uh, let's see, let's do this log t qubit and the reason it's log t is because you're writing um, this little t number uh, in binary so you only need log t bits for that and um, this is what I call the uh, so uh, I'm going to give this uh, register a name I'm going to call it the clock register right because it um, you know, it's the clock, it tells us what the time is. And this is going to be uh, the snapshot register that stores the intermediate state of our circuit at time t. So this omega t looks like you basically apply the first little t qubits, uh, sorry, little t gates on the starting state, which is going to be x some proof state psi. And what is psi? It's just some state, some m qubit uh, proof state. Right? If you have a different proof state, then you have a different ground state. So there can be multiple um, uh, ground states uh, as long as you pick some um, optimal proof state. So some proof state that uh, maximizes acceptance probability. And remember that like this is kind of like the quantum analog of this computational tableau uh, in the classical case. Right? Um, okay, so that's what the ground space looks like. Now I have to talk about the ground energy. And this will depend on whether um, the original X, this instance X, uh, is a yes instance or a no instance. So if X is, uh, happens to be a yes instance of our uh, original decision problem, then the ground energy of our feynman kataev uh, Hamiltonian will be extremely small. It will be exponentially small in, in N. But if uh, we have a no instance, then the ground energy of this Hamiltonian will be noticeably larger. So it's going to be at least some constant divided by t cubed. Okay, t is the, the size of this circuit. So, um, we know that T is poly N. 
So that means that there's a gap between the ground energies in the yes and no cases, right? That um, in one case, it's exponentially small. In the other case, it's at least some inverse polynomial large. So assuming that we're able to uh, efficiently construct this Hamiltonian, what this shows is that, you know, I can transform this arbitrary QMA language into an instance of the local Hamiltonian's problem. Where we have locality of log t, a is um, something very small, and b is some inverse polynomial. Okay. All right. So, uh, what does this this um, Hamiltonian look like? What are its terms? And it's going to you know, follow the, the classical Cook-Levin theorem pretty closely. Um, there's going to be uh, terms for, to enforce that the, uh, your history state starts OK, evolves OK, and ends OK. So the starts okay is to check that if you look at the very first snapshot, that it's a quantum state of the form x tensor psi tensor zero, right? And this means the I mean the constraints are really on these two parts, right? Like we we have no constraint on the middle part, this quantum proof state. We're just going to insist that um, we plug in the right instance into our circuit v, uh, and we also set the ancilla qubits to zero. Um, the evolves okay constraint is going to ensure that each subsequent snapshot is going to be related to the previous one just by an application of a two qubit gate, which is the tth gate. And uh, the ends okay constraint, let me write it down here. is going to just ensure that if we look at the very last snapshot, that it's uh, basically uh, of the form, uh, the first cube is going to be the state one, followed by, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just enforcing that the first qubit uh, is in the accept state, right? You want to check that the verifier circuit actually accepted. Um, okay, so, so how do we actually write this in, you know, Hamilton, uh, like as a Hamiltonian terms? So let's, uh, I'm going to have a term for, to enforce each of these X qubits, right? So I'm, I'm going to have a term like this. Um, let's see. Actually, maybe, maybe for this, uh, it'll be helpful to, to draw like the qubits that this Hamiltonian is, is working on. So if you imagine that dividing, you know, the, the qubits of this Hamiltonian to be the first log t qubits are the, the clock register. The first n, uh, the, the next n qubits will be the x register which is supposed to store the, the input to, to our circuit. We're going to have a proof register P and uh, ancilla registers uh, are the remaining ones. Okay, just to, to keep that in mind. So for the, the starts okay terms, if 
for all of the n qubits uh, for the x register, we're going to define uh, this term. Okay. So this is going to say we only care about when the time is zero. We're like we only care about the initial snapshot. Okay. So the subscript C indicates that I'm this projector acts only on the clock register. And then we want to enforce that the ith qubit of the X register is, uh, you know, set to the correct bit of the input. So this is going to be um, And, and what does this uh, little bar mean here? It just means that I'm flipping, I'm taking the complement of the uh, ith bit of xi, uh, of the instance x, right? So, so just to, to draw it out, this projector, it's a single qubit projector, and it acts on whatever qubit uh, the ith one is here. All right, so any questions about what I've written down so far? Just want to make sure that the, like, the notation is, people are comfortable with the notation and, and what it's actually saying. Uh, yes, I have a question. How do we know that what xi is so that the pro we apply the not projector? I mean, if it's a superposition, do we need to measure it so that we know which term we want the Hamiltonian to, to write on? Oh, yeah. So. Um, so X is known to us. So X is the instance. So uh, at, at the very beginning, we're given uh, an instance, um, you know, we, we know the language L, decision problem uh, L, we know the verifier and we know the instance that we're trying to convert into uh, instance of local Hamiltonians. So X is just a bit string, right? So X is, is just uh, N bits. I see, and there's, there's no algorithm where X is actually a quantum state? No, X here is, is just a, a classical string. The quantum state will come later. The quantum state is, is this proof state, uh, psi. Right, okay, thanks. So, excuse me, why are they using XI bar? Oh, good. Uh, well, we'll see in a sec, but it's, you can think of it as, um, Hamiltonian terms are kind of specifying what is forbidden. So what's forbidden is uh, xi bar. I see. Right, right now. Thanks. So yeah, this is for intuition. The Hamiltonian terms specify what to penalize. Um, but don't we want the clock register to start all zeros? Uh, yeah, so you can think of the following. It's saying that, um, you know, it's saying like, at least from the point of view of the starts okay term, like what is forbidden? It, you know, it doesn't care what's happening in the, when the clock register is not zero. But uh, if the clock register is in the state zero, then we want to forbid the ith qubit from being in this xi bar state. Does it make sense? What is a here in the, the bits? Like this thing? Yeah. Oh, it's just it's just a label for the um, the ancilla bits. Oh, okay. Any other uh, questions about the notation or 
or the meaning of this. Okay, so, you know, we just specified like the constraints that insist that at the beginning snapshot, what really should be in this register is just going to be our instance X. It's just going to be written down there. Um, now we got to put in the uh, ancilla constraints. So, um, you know, we can, we can put in, you know, how, how many ever constraint uh, ancillas there are, we can have a same thing. When the clock is zero, we want to penalize whenever the ancilla bit is in the one state. In other words, uh, we'll be happy if the ancilla bits uh, are in the zero state at the beginning of the computation. All right, so that's uh, starts okay. Uh, let's let's do ends okay first. Uh, or next, this one is very simple. It's saying that when the clock is uh, at the very last moment of the computation, we want the output qubit to be in the one state. So we penalize when it's in the zero state. So for the output qubit, I'll call it uh, O. So it looks like there was a... Uh... Oh, sorry, I missed, I, I didn't have the chat window open, but uh, hopefully, David, your question uh, was answered. All right, let's, let's uh, write evolves okay. And this one is maybe uh, the funkiest looking one. Um, we basically want to check that the transitions between the T to T plus first steps uh, are okay. And it'll look like this, uh, be kind of complicated. So we have one half, we'll have this turn. So the, for the clock qubits, we have uh, TT. We perform the identity plus T plus one. Also, uh, we also perform the identity. And this identity acts on everything except for the, the clock register. Then we're going to put a minus sign. Then we have T plus one. T tensor. Here we're going to put in the T plus first gate. Okay, so this is going to be a two qubit uh, unitary that acts on whatever two qubits the, that gate was supposed to act on. And then we're going to have the, uh, the Hermitian conjugate of this term. So here we're going to put a dagger, right? So it's going to be the inverse of this unitary. And, and that's our Hamiltonian term. Okay, so uh, it, it should look legitimate in the sense that uh, this operator that I've written down is a Hermitian operator. So it's a valid uh, Hamiltonian term. In fact, it's uh, positive semi-definite. So I've specified actually all the terms in the Feynman Kataev Hamiltonian. Our final H is going to be the sum of I equals one to N, all the, these input checking terms. We're gonna put in all the ancillas. So we have H, J, we're gonna enforce that they all start in the, the zero state. So J ranges from one to the number of ancillas. We're going to have all the transition terms so we have H T goes to T plus one, and then we have our H uh, end. So you sum all of these terms up, uh, and this is going to be the, the, the final Feynman Kataya of Hamiltonian. Can you say more about the evolves okay term, particularly uh, the first two terms there? I'm not sure I see what they do. 
uh, so do you have a question about like the notation or like why this is why this works or what? Yeah, why it works. Okay, so we'll go through that uh, like right now. Uh, good question though. So, so let's, you know, so this might look, you know, the starts okay, ends okay might look pretty reasonable, but the, yeah, the evolves okay uh, is pretty weird. So let's get some intuition for it. Um, Sorry, you said that ends okay. Um, we're checking out like the, the first few bit of the one right? Yeah, for the final snapshot. So the, the notation at the end there that says zero in the projection of zero and this is going on the first few bits there, is that like a theta or a zero or? Oh, oh th uh, this thing? Yeah. Oh, that just, yeah, refers to the, whatever you're designating as the output qubit of your circuit. Oh, okay, the output, okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, maybe right, yeah, output qubit. Yeah, I, I guess I just would, you know, zero and O's look very similar when I write them. Yeah, I just wanted to ask how many answer of bits are there? Some polynomial number. I, I didn't specify it exactly, um, but since it's a polynomial size circuit, then you allow up to a polynomial number of n cellas. So, sorry, just to harp on for a second, because uh, when we were at the end of table four, I think you were like the first qubit was in the one state. You mean like we're going to get a measurement of one? Uh, like I'm wondering if you mixed up one and zero the two times that you wrote it. Mm hmm Let's yeah. see. Uh, ends okay. Um, you mean uh, what I wrote uh, here? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this is, I guess we're writing what we hope to be the case. I mean, of course, uh, whatever state is handed to us, the the very final snapshot may not have this property, um, but we're, we're, we're writing a Hamiltonian term that is going to penalize whenever this is not, when the final snapshot doesn't look like this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Right, good questions. Um, okay, so the very last thing before before we uh, enter the break is uh, let's see why this might make sense um, and get some intuition for it. So let's, let's look at the yes case. Like, what did I claim about the yes case? Um, that the ground energy of this Hamiltonian is exponentially small, right? Um, so let's, let's actually check that this is true. Um, to show that the ground energy is small, I just have to exhibit uh, a, a low energy state. In fact, it'll just be uh, a good history state. So X, if X is then yes, uh, this means that there is some proof state psi such that um, V on our instance X, we give it the proof state, we instantiate, uh, initialize it with a bunch of zeros, accepts with probability greater than one minus exponentially small in N. Right, this is where we're, taking advantage of this amplification procedure that I talked about earlier. Uh, we can assume this with that loss of generality. Um, so the corresponding history state is, I mean, I don't need to rewrite it. it it's, it's, uh, it's just this uh, superposition. Well, okay, I will rewrite it. Um, this state's well defined, right? Because we uh, we have our our um, uh, omega zero is x tensor psi tensor uh, all zeros, and then we we just evolve it forward and put it all in superposition, and that's going to be our our, our state. So the question is, what is omega of uh, omega h omega? We want to show that it's uh, it's this this expectation value is really small. So we can show this by just ex expanding out all the terms, right? So we have all the, the input terms. We have uh, the uh, ancilla terms. We have our propagation terms.
and we have our uh, our uh, Enzo K term. And we're going to show that if we sum all of these up, it's it's only going to be exponentially small. So let's let's do it step by step. So let's do the, the input checking terms. Um, so fix fix an i. What is uh, omega of h x i omega as a number? Well, um, you know what is what is h x i? Uh, well, let me let me expand it out. So if you expand out with this omega, we're going to get uh, a superposition over uh, all snapshots. So we have uh, s comma omega s. We get on the left, and then t comma omega t on the right. But notice one thing: if we plug in the definition of h uh, i x, the only terms that survive will be the terms where the clock is zero. Right, so we get um, one over t plus one, um, and then we get omega zero. And then we have the, this xi bar acting on the i qubit of the x register. And uh, what is this number here for our choice of omega zero? So, so maybe let's remember what omega zero was. It's uh, this state here. Wouldn't it be either one over t plus one or zero, depending on whether the bit is, you know, correct or not? Um, yeah, so, well, so this projector is acting on the ith qubit of, of this state, right? Mm -hmm. So this, the ith qubit of this state will be xi. And that will be the, the opposite of xi bar. So, so those would be orthogonal states. And then Abhinav says zero, which is correct. Right? And so this is because if we have this projector xi bar times xi, right? And this xi comes from omega, right? They, they annihilate each other because they're, they're opposite basis states. So now we're only considering the case where the proof is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Because you were in the yes case and I'm saying here's the, the proof that I'm fixing uh, omega uh, and it has this form so we can exactly compute what the energy is. Right. So, so for all of these input checking terms, we're going to get zero, right? So this is a good thing. It means that this term is satisfied it has uh, zero energy or zero penalty. You know, and same thing for the ancilla terms. Right, so... Wouldn't, sorry. Uh -huh. Wouldn't all the states satisfy this? If you define xi bar to be not xi, wouldn't that always give you zero? Uh, not all, I mean, if we had a state, uh, like, you know, if I walked up with a state xi bar, um, like that was the state omega, then it would actually satisfy this. It would pick up, uh, or it, it wouldn't, sorry, it wouldn't satisfy it. It would pick up the penalty of one, right? So, you know, imagine that for some reason, we just, all we did was let omega zero be just the complement of X. And then, you know, we just filled out the rest with zeros. Then, then for this choice of omega zero, this would pick up a penalty of one. Okay. I see. Does it make sense? 
because you know you yeah you would just you know you would just expand it you would have xi bar coming from here you would have this projector coming from the Hamiltonian term xi bar this comes from here right you take these inner products they're 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 both the same state so you just get one I see yeah okay so uh, so we're taking advantage of the fact that we're choosing our proof state omega to be the right one. Um, uh, Henry, I, I still uh -huh. don't understand something. Um, if you choose omega zero to be x, uh, uh, x bar, for example, uh -huh. uh, wouldn't that change also the Hamiltonian terms to be not, not x in that case? Like, how would you know, how would you know which uh, x to put in the Hamiltonian if x is the answer? That, that that satisfies the, the, the problem. Ah, okay. So I, I think um, maybe let me uh, just clarify the picture a little bit. Um, I think there's some confusion about like what's given to you and who knows what. And um, so uh, let's let me draw it here. So the picture you should think about in in your head is that um, you know so so here's Merlin. Here's our our, our wizard, right? Um, and here's Arthur, and Arthur uh, gets x. So Arthur knows what x is. So Arthur is going to compute, based on x, compute the description of, um, of this Hamiltonian h. So he's, he, he knows exactly what Hamiltonian terms we're talking about, right? They're all the ones that I've written down here. But, but what Arthur doesn't know is Arthur doesn't know whether X is a yes instance or a no instance. So then he says, well, Merlin, why don't you help me figure it out? Um, what I know about, you know, Arthur knows that H has a low uh, ground energy if X is a yes instance. So he asks Merlin to give him a proof of this. So what Merlin will send down is some proof state uh, Omega. And what I'm describing right now is that if X is actually a yes instance, then Merlin can choose a proof state that depends on X to satisfy the, all these Hamiltonian terms. Uh, can you say that again, the last part? Sure. So Merlin can construct a proof state Omega that depends on X uh, that actually does have uh, a, a very low ground energy. Right, so that if, so that the proof state will contain an X that is a yes instance, for, for example, mm -hmm. uh, such that the, if X that Archer gets is a yes instance, it will minimize the energy uh, according to the Hamiltonian that Archer has built. Yeah, exactly. It'll be the same X. Can you just repeat then what uh, psi is? <clears throat> psi? Oh, good. So psi is, um, it's the, is the quantum state uh, that, that if you plugged in x, psi, and zero into this verification circuit would have been accepted with one minus two to the minus n probability. Isn't that what Merlin gives? Like, uh, I might be a bit confused here. So like Merlin provides the proof, right? Mm -hmm. So like Merlin gives psi. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, okay. So <laughs> I guess that's uh, kind of confusing. There's like two situations with, between Merlin and Arthur here. Um, okay, so, so maybe it's, it's just good to, you know, let's, let's reset, let's like start from uh, a blank page. Uh, what am I saying that we're given? We're given this QMA problem L. L doesn't have to do anything with a local Hamiltonian problem. It's just, you know, it could be this group non-membership problem. It could, you know, be, you know, um, it could be, you know, the traveling salesman problem or, you know, whatever, right? It's just some QMA problem L. Uh, since it's in QMA, we know that there's a verifier circuit for it that has this property. If, 
if X is a yes instance, then there's a proof that gets accepted with very, very high probability. If X is a no instance, then it gets uh, re, you know, accepted with very low probability. Okay, uh, with me so far? Yes. Okay, so we're going to, you know, but this is not a local Hamiltonian problem. It's just some arbitrary like quantum circuit. I want to convert this uh, into an instance of the local Hamiltonian's problem. So, so given this, you know, this Arthur knows V and he knows X, but he's going to convert it into uh, uh, an instance of H where, um, you know, now Merlin, instead of providing him uh, the, this original psi, he can provide him a ground state of a local Hamiltonian, in particular, this Feynman Kataev Hamiltonian. Okay, so like you have basically changed the problem or problem of the, the Skiomer problem to a local Hamiltonian problem where now the verifier instead of giving you the proof or Merlin instead of giving you the proof is giving you a ground state and then you can just, okay. Exactly, perfect. That's, yeah, well said. All right, we're, we're basically showing that we can convert any QMA problem into a local Hamiltonian problem. Alrighty. Um, okay, we're almost done with the, this calculation. So in ancilla terms, we see that for this choice of uh, proof state omega, we're going to get zeros. Uh, what about the, the propagation terms? I'll need a little more space for this. Okay, so let's fix a T. <clears throat> um, okay, so if you expand this out, uh, there's gonna be a bunch of terms, but the point is that this is also zero. Okay, and it basically, you know, when you expand out this calculation, you're only going to pick out terms that have to involve the snapshots t or t plus one, right? So, so you know, this is basically equal to uh, this. I mean, there's a prefactor out in front, but it doesn't matter really, right? Because all, all other snapshots uh, just drop away. Uh, okay, so there's, there's also a timestamp associated with them. Right, there's T and then there's uh, Okay, and when you, yeah, when you just expand all the terms, you'll, you'll see that actually, uh, um, I, I mean, it'll just cancel. So, uh, and, and the reason it cancels is because we actually, you know, by construction, we really do have the fact that this T plus first snapshot is equal to this. So as long as you have this, uh, this propagation term will, will be satisfied. Okay, so, um, you know, we have, we've just seen that these three terms all evaluate to zero. So where is the ground energy coming from? It must come from this uh, this uh, Enzo K uh, check, and, and that's what we'll, we'll verify. So we'll have omega H end, omega. And again, if you open it up, you're only going to involve the very last snapshot, right? And we're just going to apply the projector that projects on the, the zero state of the first qubit, All right? But what is this? This is saying, like, if you took the very last state of the computation, 
and you measured the first qubit in the standard basis, what is the probability you obtain a zero? Exactly the the prob the probability that v g g g g given x and psi will will accept. Sorry, uh, will 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 reject. Exactly, which is uh, exponentially small in n. <clears throat> Perfect. Right, so this is exactly what we wanted to show. This is at most one over t plus one, something that's exponentially tiny, which is you know still exponentially tiny. Right, and that's where all the energy comes from. It just comes from this final energy checking term. Um, okay, so so this is the yes case. This is sort of what, at least why. Uh, for the yes case, this Hamiltonian kind of makes sense. Um, the no case, as always, is, is all, uh, trickier. Um, but the, uh, you know, just to give you a little intu intuition, you know, let's say that we really had a, a history state. Uh, and we want to know what is the energy of the history state with respect to H. Um, we can run through the exact same calculations that we did before. And we see that the energy contribution is just going to come from the end term, right? Because you know, as long as we have a valid history state, all the terms uh, you know, starts okay, evolves okay, will be satisfied. And this will be the probability that uh, V rejects, right? Um, which in the no case is going to be large. This is going to be one minus exponentially small in n divided by t plus one. And this is, you know, roughly equal to, uh, oh, that's a bad, you know, it, let's say that it's one over two t. And this is, instead of being an exponentially small number, it's polynomially small. Okay, so, so you can see here that at least history states have a higher energy in the no case. Okay, what about non-history states? What if you, you, know, you say, well, maybe it has a, a low, eigen, you know, low energy eigenvalue that, that's not a history state. Right. It, but the point is, it doesn't matter. You can show using uh, some you know, more involved analysis that this always is at least one over T cubed. What if you have um, like your state, uh, which is like just like a pure state, but it starts with um, like timestamp, say like T plus one, like big T plus one. Wouldn't that um, evaluate to zero on all the uh, Hamiltonian terms? Oh, good question. Okay, so I'm implicitly assuming that um, uh, it, that's not a, like, that's not part of the, like the clock register is only spanned by zero, uh, zero up to T. Okay. Uh, if, if that's not the case, then you can also add additional uh, Hamiltonian terms that penalize, uh, say, if your clock is out of range, then you just add an energy penalty to that. Right. Good question. Okay. Uh, okay, so I think we're ready for a break. Um, but this completes the, you know, the, at least the, the, the presentation of this Feynman Kataev Hamiltonian. And hopefully now you have a little better sense of, of how it's capturing uh, the, the QMA verification computation. Okay. Uh, so maybe let's come back at uh, 520. Um, and in the meantime, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Uh, I have one. Uh, uh -huh. Can you convince us that all the terms of the Hamiltonian are actually local? Uh, okay, I can try. <laughs> um, so I, I, 
I wasn't claiming that it's very, very local. It's, it's log t local, but let's verify that. Okay, so let's start with these terms. Um, this part acts on the clock register, which is log t qubits. Okay, uh, and this extra term acts on the single qubit. All right, so overall this is log t plus one local. Okay. But it can fine. act on all the clock register, like the predictors. It can act on all the clock registers, yes. Okay, got it. And, you know, same thing here. Uh, same thing here. Um, this one, again, you know, you act on clock register and then you only have uh, two qubits here. So it's log t plus two. So all the terms are at most log t plus two local. Um, you, you know, you probably shouldn't be so satisfied with this uh, because t is a growing number, right? And log t is a growing number. Um, but like I said, it's possible to uh, do some tricks to actually make it really local, like say three local. And one way to do that is in store, instead of writing the, the clock in the binary, you express the clock in unary. Like you just have a, t a number of tally marks that indicate what time it is. So maybe I'll just write it here. But then don't you need t qubits instead of log t? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know. And, you know, the Hamiltonian terms only have to look at, um, you know, the, the spot that you're interested, that, you know, you're transitioning from one zero to one one or something like that. So you only need to look at a couple qubits of the clock register. Um, you're right that the clock register is now t qubits, but that's okay uh, because you bought yourself um, some locality on, on the Hamiltonian terms. And so using this trick, uh, you immediately get a five local uh, Hamiltonian. And then by just continuing to be extra clever with how you encode clocks and stuff, you can get down to three and uh, people have been able to get it down to two. Um, but it you know, requires more work. Okay, so the 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 non locality well, the the the, the most qubits that uh, we use in the local terms, uh, quote unquote, comes from the the clock register, right? So, mm -hmm. okay, okay, got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I guess there's also the question of, of restricting what kind of Hamiltonian terms you have, because I guess the ones that people care about in practice are just the poly Hamilton poly matrices. So do so. Is there what's the intuition behind restricting the local terms? Oh, uh, you're, are you asking whether <clears throat> because the terms I've wrote, written here they aren't obviously poly observables? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so it's not much of a restriction because uh, you can always expand this in a basis of, of poly observables. Um, you'll pick up negative term, like negative, plus positive and negative coefficients. Uh, but if you're okay with that, then, then you can really express this as, yeah, it's, it's not uh, any less general to just say you only have poly observables as your Hamiltonian terms. Right, but, I guess, but I guess then this, this uh, U can be an arbitrary unitary. Oh, uh, this U can be an arbitrary unitary. Um, Yes, as well, arbitrary two qubit unitary. Oh, but, the, but then it can be approximated by, by the poly ones. Uh, no, you can actually, uh, any, I claim that any operator, any Hermitian operator can be written as a linear combination of, of poly operators. Oh, right. Exactly. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, some people, uh, say, I mean, along, along this line of questioning, say, well, what if you wanted to have, I mean, remember that like last lecture I said, oh, here's a couple of interesting Hamiltonians that 
people in condensed matter and, and, and physics like to consider, like the, the, um, the Heisenberg model or, you know, things like that. Uh, and so people uh, try to say, can I uh, find a graph uh, on which uh, I can encode QMA hard problems on? And, and all the terms look like X, X, Y, Y, or Z, Z. And uh, I don't know if for the specific case of the Heisenberg model, but for many models of interest, people have been able to do so. Like, I think people have shown that the Hubbard model is QMA complete, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, what is, how do you interpret that as saying, well, you know, these physical models that people actually can uh, encounter in nature and, and are very interested in, they're rich enough to encode QMA hard computations. So we shouldn't expect fast algorithms to be able to uh, figure out what the ground energies are, or what the ground states are of, of these uh, physical models, at least not, not in the general case. But you're saying that for all of these models, there most of the times there is some graph uh, which encodes a QMA hard, a QMA complete problem, but these graphs typically don't happen in nature, right? Uh, or, or maybe like a Hubbard model in a, a very high dimensionality or something like that. Right. So, so there, you know, it's it's sort of uh, it's an ongoing. Um, it's kind of a very interesting area of research where from one direction, people are coming up with better and better algorithms or better techniques to solve these, like say the Hubbard model. But from the other direction, from the complexity direction, people are saying we can actually encode QMA hard problems in simpler and simpler types of graphs. So just, just to give you an example, people have shown that uh, you can have uh, nearest neighbor Hamiltonians that are nearest neighbor on one dimensions, right? Uh, not on qubits, but on uh, slightly higher dimensional uh, systems, like Q eight dimensional or something. Uh, these Hamiltonians are in general QMA complete. And one dimensional systems in some sense are, people usually think of them as the simplest kind of uh, quantum mechanical systems to analyze, you know, nearest neighbor one dimensional uh, interactions. Um, so it tells us that even in this supposedly simple case, there's really, uh, problems of high complexity. And there's no analytical solution for this uh, one dimensional uh, problem? No. Yeah, I, but, I, I mean, it sort of tells you that, yeah. Yeah, but I guess the catch is that the, the particles have to be like eight dimensions or, or something like that. They're not, they're not qubits. They're not qubits, yeah. Um, I did have a question I wanted to ask, but on that point, kind of like a philosophical question like what does it say about the fact that like nature is so um, like complicated in that way like like what is nature using to compute these you know probabilities uh, um, well I guess um, you know I I think what it's telling us is that nature okay there's a couple answers to this one is that if nature if you have a physical system and nature does find the ground uh, state then in some sense, this system is not the hardest possible. It's not the most complicated system that nature could have encountered. Um, you know, if nature solved it, then likely we would also be able to, to solve for the ground state as well. You know, um, the, uh, the other way to look at it is that in a lot of cases, um, nature doesn't actually find um, the, the ground state of that physical system. It just finds like a local minima, right? And it gets stuck there. And actually, uh, you know, this actually is very common. Like, you know, people sort of the kind of like a very popular science view of like, for example, biology, when you say you take a string of amino acids, right? They, they fold up into a, a protein and a lot of in a, an overly simplistic view is to say, well, it folds up into its, its, its ground state energy. Um, but actually nature does not do that. It just folds it up into something that's relatively stable, uh, but it's not necessarily the ground configuration. Uh, and th this is also backed up by the, the complexity theory because uh, given a string of amino acids to determine what is its minimum energy configuration, this is an NP uh, complete problem or at, at least NP hard. Um, and, and so it would be very surprising if nature was able to, to uh, find the minimum energy configuration, but, but actually we know it doesn't.
Uh, I don't know if that, that answers your question. Yeah, I, I don't know that my question had what I can answer, but yeah, it's, I appreciate the thoughts. So coming back to this uh, 1D problem with, uh, I won't say uh, qubits, but uh, I don't know what the eighth dim dimension of the uh, qubit is, but uh, if you could design a quantum computer that has these uh, eight energy level um, quantum of, an, of uh, information, uh, and then you could do operations which implement the Hamiltonian terms of that, uh, then that would that mean that with this device you could solve any QMA complete problem or any QMA problem, basically? Yeah, um, probably not because, um, you know, you build this quantum computer, but, but how would you actually try to find the ground state? Uh, I mean, um, by, by implementing the Hamiltonian terms, I imagine you mean like uh, evolving the Hamiltonian, um, but that itself doesn't, doesn't necessarily take you to the ground state. Um, Right, or if there's some version of the quantum phase estimation uh, for the system. If you do you it would... slowly enough, it should, no? Right, you could do a diabetic. Yeah, but that would in general take uh, exponential time, as, as far as we know. Uh, you can do it adiabatically, um, but the, uh, you know, with these, um, uh, uh, yeah, with these QMA hard problems, the spectral gap uh, closes exponentially fast. Right. So, so the adiabatic evolution will take exponential time. Mm -hmm. As far as we can, I mean, none of this is proven, but this is like what we believe is true. Um, great. So. Uh, very good questions. Uh, any more before we, we continue on? Okay, um, good. So now let's, let's sort of step back. Uh, you know, remember this dictionary that uh, we had before? Maybe I'll go back to my previous lecture notes. Right, so we had this classical quantum dictionary, and I think we've gone through, you know, we've seen the correspondence between everything, right? We've, you know, NP to QMA, and now we've seen Cook 11 gets mapped to Feynman and Kataev. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, you know, so, I, you know, let's, let's sort of review actually, well, where did classical computer science go after the discovery of NP completeness, right? So the Cook 11 theorem, was discovered in the 1970s, right? And it's been, uh, well, I guess like 50 years since, uh, since then. Uh, and so what have we learned uh, uh, since that time period? Uh, so so I, I'm basically going, you know, for the next like half hour, I'm gonna just give like a, a whirlwind overview of, of where uh, classical theoretical computer science went. And that will inform us uh, for where uh, maybe we should, the questions we should be asking about local Hamiltonians and QMA completeness, right? So, you know, so let's talk about some history. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, we had um, the Cook-Levin theorem and, and people discovered this notion of NP completeness. And it was, at the time it was like, oh wow, all these computational problems that everyone is trying to do, you know, whether it's like scheduling or route planning or chip design or logistics or AI or, you know, whatever, um, all of these, uh, the reason, all people have been having trouble finding algorithms to, to solve these problems um, can all be explained by NP completeness. They're all NP complete problems. Right? So it's like this unifying theory. Um, so that was exciting, but also kind of uh, potentially like bad news. Was well, saying, uh, do, should we have any hope of, of solving them? I mean, we want to solve them regardless, but maybe there's a way around this hardness. Uh, maybe we can, instead of trying to solve these problems exactly, uh, maybe there's an, a, a faster or more efficient way to solve them um, approximately. Right, so people shortly thereafter, like in the, you know, the 1980s and, and, and so on, um, they're trying to get around this barrier of NP completeness.
and 1980s onward, a sort of a big theme was, well, let's try to solve things approximately. Right, so, um, you know, as an example, right, let's, let's recall this max cut problem, right, you have a graph and, and the max cut problem says, well, let's try to split it into two where you have the, the maximum number of edges cr uh, crossing the cut. Uh, but instead of trying to find the max, you know, the true optimum uh, cut, let's find one uh, where, you know, uh, that's pretty good. Trying to find uh, uh, a cut where the number of uh, edges that cross the cut is at least, let's say, 90%, 99% of the optimal cut. Right. Is that possible? I mean, 99% is pretty good. So, uh, you know, if there's a polynomial time algorithm for it, then, you know, let's just use that and not worry about trying to get 100%. Or what about, uh, you know, say 3SAT? Um, we know that it's NP-hard to find an assignment that satisfies all of the clauses, but maybe let's not care about all the clauses. Let's try to satisfy, you know, find an assignment that satisfies 90% of them. Right, so these are all uh, approximation versions of these NP-hard problems. Okay. And um, people came up with really interesting and really great uh, polynomial time approximation algorithms for a number of problems of interest. Right, so it's a, like a, a, a huge field that, you know, um, many, many algorithms people come up with. For example, people have come up with approximation algorithms for max cut. It doesn't do as well as 99%, but uh, you can come up with, there's a polynomial time algorithm that comes up uh, with an 85, 87.5% uh, approximation. Okay, so, so that's possible. Um, there are approximation algorithms for the traveling salesman problem. Uh, you know, there's, there's ones for set cover, uh, independent set, uh, and so on. Many, many um, fundamental optimization problems that people try to solve all the time. So this is great. Um, th we have approximation algorithms, and you might have hoped that uh, maybe it's possible for all of these NP-complete problems, we can find arbitrarily good approximations to them in polynomial time. Approximation algorithms for independent set? Uh, like, it, 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 you sound it, so, is there not one? Isn't the best approximation for independent set just take what, 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 what one node? And that's the best you, you, you can hope ho, 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 ho for. I think that's a result by Hastad, but I might be mistaken. I think you're probably right. I might have mistakenly wrote independent set um, net because I'm not sure. Let me cross it out and then uh, some, yeah. I might be wrong. I'll check that. Yes, yeah. please do. Yeah, I think it's one of those problems that can't be approximated to any yeah. polynomial factor. Okay, uh, yes. So, so maybe not independent sense a, a bad uh, example, but um, I think uh, I'll just, put down a generic one that, you know, definitely has for, you know, there's lots of scheduling problems, for example, that emit very, very good approximation algorithms. And, you know, people run them, they, you know, solve uh, NP complete problems to a pretty good enough uh, approximation factor and everyone's happy. Um, okay, but, you know, like, Yuval and Adrian are hinting at, uh, there are some problems that actually maybe you can't approximate um, that well. Okay, so 
But you know, in the 80s, people didn't really have a, a very clear idea of what the limitations are. So, so this is what was a thread of questioning. Um, okay, so that's about approximation algorithms. Let me change tracks uh, just a little bit. Um, now I'm going to talk about something that seems uh, completely different from approximation algorithms. And this is going to be about, you know, computer scientists coming up with really radical notions of what a, a proof is. Okay. Um, and this was also like really intensely studied in the 1980s, just coming up with crazy ideas of, of what a proof might be. And we've already touched upon this, right? Like back in, I don't know, lecture two, I said, uh, this notion of QMA is, is, is saying, well, we're coming up with a quantum analog of, of checking a proof, right? So there's already a twist. We've already seen that we can uh, apply a twist to what proof checking is instead of Merlin handing you a, a piece of text that you check deterministically line by line and, and verify that the proof is correct. Uh, Merlin can hand you a quantum state um, that you perform some measurement on and that can help you convince, convince you of whether something is correct or not. Say, like convince you that the ground energy of a local Hamiltonian is small, right? Um, in the 1980s, quantum computing and QMA and stuff wasn't on people's radar. So they didn't think of QMA. Um, but they were really interested in something known as an interactive proof. Okay, so in an interactive proof, the idea is pretty natural. Like you have Merlin, you have Arthur, and what we've talked about so far is Merlin sends something. It's a piece of text or a quantum state to Arthur, and he checks it. But this is just a one-way communication, right? Um, why not have them engage in a dialogue, right? So, you know, imagine that Arthur, he gets some instance X of some decision problem. He wants to know if it's a yes instance. Uh, you know, why not interrogate or consult Merlin and, and come up with follow-up questions to, to get some evidence for whether X is a yes instance or not? Right. So basically you have a dialogue and, um, you know, more formally, like, uh, we say that a decision problem L has an interactive proof. So I'll denote that by IP. If, um, if X is in the yes instance, then by having this two way conversation, Arthur is convinced or accepts with probability at least two thirds. But if X is a no instance, then no matter what Merlin will say, Arthur won't be fooled and he'll accept with low probability. Okay. So this is what we mean. You know, this is a notion of an interactive proof. Okay, so, um, you know, for those, you know, if, if you've seen, uh, taken a complexity class before uh, or you've uh, seen this, um, don't answer. But uh, if you haven't seen it before, there, do you have any, do, does, do people have a sense of whether uh, being able to interrogate Merlin helps you with uh, proof checking, you know, as compared to NP or, or QMA? Actually, maybe, maybe let me, uh, I've never done this poll feature before, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try this. Let me add a, a poll. Um, give me one second. We're comparing to a situation, uh, you know, say where Merwin gives one, uh, you know, bit string of information where that string is li limited in size. Uh, yes. Um, so the, 
the string is limited to polynomial in the size of the instance. In this interactive setting, um, the, we just have to say that the, the total communication is at most, like if you concatenate all the messages together, it's at most polynomial length. Okay. So it's comparable. And, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm just trying this poll feature. Does that work? You know what? Um, Someone just doesn't seem to update. Okay. So if if you think that uh, it it you know this this ability to interact with with Merlin might help Arthur, you know you can raise your hand in the or give a thumbs up in the uh, in the Zoom. Or like thumbs up at like if you click on the what's it called the the more button you can do a thumbs up okay some people think it does but not many okay Gary doesn't think that it helps Andrew think that it helps okay. I'm going to assume that most people have heard of this before, but um, uh, can you re repeat the question, please? My connect, 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 connection was off, or was there no que question? Oh uh, well, my question is: uh, Do you think that interaction helps uh, Arthur? Like, is it a does it give him an extra ability to uh, to solve decision problems? Well. If I knew the answer to that, uh, I would be pretty fam fam famous, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Because conditional, do you, do you believe complexity assumptions? Can we assume those? <laughs> yeah, if you assume that P is not equal to P space, then. Sure. Okay, well, I think people are giving it away. So, um, well, let, let, me, let me say this. Um, the belief is that interaction uh, uh, is an inc incredibly powerful um, ability uh, for Arthur as, convinced, as, as compared to just having a one-way message from Merlin. Um, and one way to maybe get a gut intuition for this is that, you know, um, imagine that, you know, someone gave you a really complicated math proof or math textbook to digest and they just handed you like this textbook and say, just understand this. Um, as compared to the ability to have a one-on-one -on -one tutor where you were able to ask questions and say, oh, I don't understand this part. Can you explain this to me? You know, which situation is, uh, is it easier to learn something and to be convinced of something? And I, I think most of us would say that it's much easier to, to it be able to interact with someone and, and ask them questions, right? And, and this is kind of formalized uh, in a complexity theoretic sense. Um, so, the set of problems that decision problems that can be solved using interactive proof is uh, proved to be equal to P space, right? And P space, we, you saw this on the problem set, it's a set of problems that can be solved using polynomial space. And P space is a huge complexity class. You can solve incredibly difficult problems uh, uh, in it. Um, so this was a, a, like an amazing result that was proved in like the 90s um, by I'll just write the initials here by Lund, uh, Fortnow, Karloff, and, and Nissan. Um, and, and you know, if you're not so familiar with these complexity classes, let me, let me draw a diagram. Um, you know, here's our, our class P, polynomial time. It's a, the set of problems we can solve efficiently using classical computers. Um, you know, here's NP, we think it's separate. Um, what about quantum computers? Well, we think it's sort of separate from, you know, it contains P. It's more classical than, it's more powerful than classical computers. It's separate from NP. Um, QMA, right, includes all of these. Includes them, like the local Hamiltonians problem and so on. And where does P space fit? Well, it, it contains all of these. Okay, and, and much, much more. 
so all of these problems in this huge class uh, can be solved uh, using an interactive proof between a polynomial time Arthur and, um, uh, uh, and a Merlin. And, it's, and you know, to emphasize, this is a classical Arthur. So in particular, this local Hamiltonian's problem, right, uh, has uh, an interactive proof between um, Merlin and a classical Arthur, right? So why is this maybe surprising? Like normally Merlin would say, well, if you wanna be convinced about the local Hamiltonian problem, here's the ground state. But the ground state is some quantum state, right? And a classical Arthur wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, he can't make a measurement. He can't, you know, the, the, this quantum proof would just sort of like, you know, melt in his hands. Um, so, so that's no good. So that won't, wouldn't be a, a, a good way for uh, Merlin to convince Arthur of, you know, the Hamiltonian's problem. But instead they can like engage in some really intricate dialogue uh, with, you know, that only takes polynomial uh, time. And at the end, Arthur will, will be convinced that, you know, the grounds, uh, the energy of this local Hamiltonian is, is indeed low. So in addition to um, the polynomial limit on communication, Arthur also only requires polynomial time. Yes. So in particular, this Arthur, like he doesn't have the ability to perform quantum computation. So he can't, you know, presumably he can't factor in integers or, you know, anything. Um, you know, all he's uh, able to do is, is just use the power of P, polynomial time. But he has the help of this Merlin, who he doesn't trust, but he can, he can ask these follow-up questions too. Okay, so, so that's like, um, one amazing thing, you know, this interaction is, is really powerful. Um, okay. Uh, and people said, well, why stop there? Instead of having, you know, why don't we further like change, like uh, put a, another twist on uh, this notion of proof. And instead of having one Merlin, let's have two Merlins. Right. You know, so people are really going bonkers here. Um, Right, so, so there's, uh, not, there's only one Arthur, uh, but now Arthur gets to talk with uh, two separate Merlins, Merlin one and Merlin two. Now, what's the point of having mul you know, more than one? Well, the point is that they, they're not allowed to talk to each other. So you imagine, you know, Arthur puts one Merlin in one room, puts another Merlin in a different room, and he just runs between the rooms saying, hey, I wanna solve this problem, try to convince me. Um, and by putting them in separate rooms, Arthur can cross interrogate the Merlins against each other, you know, to maybe check that they're consistent. Um, you know, the, a, a very common picture that people like to, to use is say, imagine a policeman trying to interrogate two suspects who are accused of committing a crime. Uh, and so by putting the suspects in different rooms, you can really try to catch them in some inconsistency to, um, to, to, to try to get at the truth. Right, so this is the notion of a, a multi-prover interactive proof because there's multiple provers here. Right, and you can also say, well, what decision problems can be solved in this model? Uh, and, and this is denoted by the complexity class MIP. And another like amazing result in complexity theory is that this having an extra Merlin gives you even more power to, to this, you know, gives Arthur even more power to, to solve decision problems. It turns out that MIP is equal to uh, something called NX or non-deterministic exponential time. So this is the uh, exponential time version of NP. So it's like, you know, imagine trying to solve exponentially large three sat instances or exponentially large instances of the traveling salesman problem. That's what NX allows you to do. Uh, and here, Arthur is still polynomial time, still only talks to, you know, the Merlins 
uh, using a, a polynomial amount of communication, and yet he's able to solve these like massively difficult problems. So this also was proved in the 90s by Babai, Fortnow, and Lund. Okay. Um, okay, and, and, and where does NX? I mean, NX is, is even a more massive class. It contains P space. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's like ridiculously huge. And um, I think it's worth mentioning that opposed to, to P space, we know that P does not e, e, equal next. Oh, yes. Okay. So, um, you know, I've drawn these, uh, I've drawn all these bubbles here and, and it gives the impression that one's bigger than the other. We actually don't know if these bubbles are separate. Um, the only, you know, as, as far as we know, P space could uh, be the same class as P. Right, we, we, we don't know that they're different. I think, I mean, we, we strongly believe that they do. Um, it's, you know, everyone's heard of this P versus NP problem, right? If you've proved that P is different from NP, that would imply that P is different from P space, obviously. Um, but, you know, we don't know that, we don't know that these two are different. But like you've all mentioned, one of the very few things we know about complexity classes is that P is different from NX. Not, not only that, but NP, right? NP is distinct from exponential NP. Those are different, right? So, yes. Do Merlin's have the option of like not answering questions in this interaction? Oh, if, if Merlin was just being a jerk and um, he could, uh, but then Arthur would say, well, if you're not gonna answer my questions, then I'm not going to be convinced that X is the yes instance. So, um, uh, you know, so the, the way to think about it here is that Merlin is trying his best to convince that X is a yes instance, whether or not it is. So if X is a yes instance, then Merlin can say the right things. If X is a no instance, then Merlin will try his best to say, you know, to try to trick Arthur into believing that it is uh, a yes instance. Okay. Um, let me end uh, today by getting to what I really wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, why am I talking about this? I mean, it's, it's kind of cool and it's like a nice uh, tour of computer science history. Um, I wanted to bring us to something called probabilistically checkable proofs. Right. So like I said, people were coming up with really crazy notions of proof and they proved like these amazing things about these different notions um, and they, Shortly after this IP equals P space and MMP equals NX results, they, they then moved on to think about this other kind of proof, which I'll call PCP, probably checkable proofs. And it's, it's a twist on NP proof checking. So we're going to go back to the non-interactive setting. So again, Merlin just sends one thing to, to Arthur. Uh, it's not two-way. Um, but Arthur is not allowed to look at the entire proof. In a PCP, Arthur only looks at a f small number of random locations in this proof. Right, so, so like, you know, Merlin sends this piece of text over and then Arthur just like flips some coins and says, I want to look at locations 100, 105, and 2006. And uh, when Arthur selects those, those um, points in the proof, he sees three bits. And based on those three bits and only those three bits, he has to decide whether to accept or reject.
you know, it doesn't have to be three, but just some small number of locations. Okay, and um, in order for a decision problem to have a, a PCP or probabilistically checkable proof, there must be a way that um, Arthur can do this where uh, if X is a yes instance, Arthur again accepts with probability two thirds. And if it's, it's a no instance, then no matter, well, you know, over, over the choice of like which random location he chooses with high probability, he's going to reject. Right, so that's, that's what a PCP is. And it sounds like a very like limited form of proof checking. I mean, you only see three bits. How much could you actually learn about whether, uh, you know, the instance was a yes instance or a no instance, right? Like, you know, something to keep in mind is like, let's say the traveling salesman uh, problem, right? I claim that this graph has a very short tour. Uh, how can I convince you that it has a short tour um, where you only look at three bits of something, right? It seems difficult. So here's the, the PCP theorem, and I'll call this the proof checking version. And uh, what this says is the following. Um, so let's, let's fix epsilon to some really small constant. Um, I don't know, let, let's say like uh, one over a hundred just for concreteness. For all decision problems in NP, there exists a randomized polynomial time verifier. Okay, this verifier receives a proof, but it only uh, looks at three bits of this proof. Okay, um, well, and, and all of these conditions hold. So all problems in NP admit a, uh, a probabilistically checkable proof. Okay, so um, this is pretty mind bending, right? Because- Wait, what's epsilon? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I kind of mixed and matched my, um, let, let me do it this way. So let's say uh, one minus epsilon and, and uh, this is actually to, this epsilon is just to make it coincide with like what the, the this actual statement is supposed to be. So, so think of this as just like 99% and 51%. Okay, so, so like to just sort of wrap your mind around what this implies, it's like saying um, for like this traveling salesman problem that I mentioned, I can actually convince you that it has a, if it really has a short, you know, tour through the, the map, I can convince you of this fact by giving, you know, writing down a proof and you just randomly choose three locations in the proof and, and you can tell what, high probability whether uh, it's true or not. If there is no short tour, then, then you will, uh, with high probability, reject. Um, you know, another way that I like to think about it is, you know, suppose that some alien mathematician comes to Earth uh, and he claims that, um, you know, uh, this alien has a marvelous, wonderful proof of the Riemann hypothesis, um, which would be, you know, really exciting to all of us. Um, but this alien's proof, unfortunately, is stored on a hard disk that's like 20 times the size of our galaxy. Uh, well, good luck trying to read it. Um, 
But fortunately, we have the PCP theorem at our disposal. So it says that uh, you say, well, um, we can't verify your hard disk, but uh, maybe you can encode it using this PCP. Uh, and we can just check, say, you know, maybe not three, but like a, a thousand random locations in your hard disk. Uh, and we can verify whether your proof uh, of the Riemann hypothesis is correct or not. And in principle, this is possible. Um, Wait, I, but I, oh, yes, so, 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 sorry, go, go ahead. Um, so, so I, I assume there's some kind of relationship between this epsilon, um, the polynomial time, and this three, like maybe polynomial time in one over epsilon, or this three is some, or, or epsilon is some function of the three or something like that. Oh, good question. So three is fixed. It really is three. The polynomial time will depend on epsilon. So it'll be, you know, poly one over epsilon. Um, if I remember correct, correct, correctly, you can assume that you have like O of log n bits of ra randomness as well. So you can assume that the PCP proof is polynomial in length. Right. And and so you won't have a proof the size of the ga uh, uh, of the galaxy, but yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on what your constant factors are. Yes, so, yes, yes, true. Yeah, true. You know, this constant's gonna get pretty large. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, the PCP theorem. It, it's it's really a remarkable result, um, and I guess we're out of time now, but. Uh, you know, you know, next time when we, when we take this back up, um, I'll explain, okay, it's an amazing result. It actually, this PCP theorem actually connects back to this question of existence of approximation algorithms, right? Um, the PCP theorem is actually equivalent to the fact that many uh, constraint satisfaction problems or optimization problems are NP hard even to approximate? Optimization. And, and not only that, but it allows you to pin down exactly what's the threshold between which approximation factors are easy to, to accomplish and beyond which it's NP hard. And there's this beautiful theory that's developed around it, and it really uh, comes from this um, PCP theorem, this this crazy proof checking that it uh, that implies all of this. Um, and looking ahead, okay, so this is what people have proved, and and now the big question is: Is there a quantum analog of this PCP theorem? And this is like one of the holy grails of uh, of quantum complexity theory of whether something like this is true. Um, and, it had, and it has a lot of really interesting implications if it were true for like condensed matter physics and, and uh, many body physics. Uh, and so we'll get into that next time. Uh, okay, so, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for if people have any. I'm curious uh, about the PCP theorem. Um, that like generally in complexity theory, we ignore like things like encoding, like, you know, it doesn't matter for encoding information in binary bits or stuff like that. But to me, it seems like that would affect this theorem, at least naively, or is there a reason why it doesn't? So, uh, like if we're saying like three like locations in memory, that's three bits. Is yeah. that like a quantity of information you're about to look at? Or like, um, you know, say you were, storing something in a bigger base than two, um, mm -hmm. would you still be allowed three looks? Ah, um, th so that depends on the PCP you're, you're interested in. Uh, there's, there's, there's many, many PCP theorems and for different trade-offs of parameters and, and so on. Um, there's versions where you can store the symbols in, in bigger um, uh, uh, basis or yeah, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, the important part is that you have a small number of locations to look at. Uh, and uh, if you could store more information into each location, then you actually can improve the parameters. Like 
you know, the prob in the no instance, you can actually say that the verifier accepts with very, very small probability if you're allowed to look at things that are more than bits. Um, so th that's a flexibility that you're allowed to, to modify in this PCP theorem. Uh, if you have only three bits of information, how does how does increasing the time complexity uh, uh, affect epsilon? How like how are you able to reduce epsilon by changing the time complexity? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so it kind of works like this. Um, so the smaller, I mean. Here, you kind of want to decrease epsilon, right? Because you want to like improve your confidence of whether it's in the yes or no cases. And in order to improve your confidence, you have to just, um, you have to like kind of make your, your, your queries more and more complicated. Like you're, you're basically this verifier is going to do a lot of pre-processing to say, to try to figure out, okay, what kind of proof do I expect Merlin to give me? Um, and the smaller you're making epsilon, the proof is gonna get more and more complicated. I mean, you're still only gonna look at three locations, but the format of this proof will get, will get bigger. Um, and so that's why your, your, the verifier time will also increase because you're, you're trying to like strategize like which locations am I going to pick. So, so V is like um, choosing the format of the proof in order to maximize the probability. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can say that. Well, it, it's, it's, you know, V is picking the format of the proof that it uh, expects. Um, and then it also has to randomly choose which locations uh, it's going to look at. Um, and uh, we're, we're assuming that Merlin knows ahead of time what the format's supposed to be. But okay. V has to like compute it. Yeah. Um, so me and Lo Logan are supposed to scribe this uh, le lecture. Is there some template uh, that we can start to work with? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll send you I'll send you guys a Slack message um, with all of the details, like instructions on on what like specifically we need to do and stuff. <laughs> 